Good morning. If God's been good to you, say amen. amen. We serve a good God. I'm very thankful to see Riley here, and to, I'm happy to see Shayla. And Riley, you lost some hair, I see. Um, that mullet's gone. That's probably a good thing. I um, want to also um, say thank you for everyone that's been participating in the SHARE event over here this weekend, Tamika and everyone else being involved. It's really neat to see the blessing that we can be towards each other and other people in the community in so many different ways. And also want to say Happy Mother's Day to, to all the moms and also to every woman that influences and impacts the next generation being a, a spiritual mother of people, of uh, discipling those around them um, is a powerful thing to help influence those that come after us. And um, so we want to give some honor to that. Today we're going to be, oh, also happy you're here too, Adam. Uh, and uh, it's good to see you. Um, today we're going to be continuing our series in the Sermon on the Mount. This is our ninth lesson now, going back to Jesus' fundamental beginning teachings. And the title for this lesson is Loving Your Enemies. This is the subject in which Jesus continues to raise the bar and how we're supposed to live in this world. So let's dive right into it. So our first verse in verse 43, we see here, but you have heard that it was said. Again, this common phrase Jesus is using in this lesson where he's pointing to these Jews is memory where they have been hearing things from the Old Testament so much throughout um, over millennia at this point. And they've heard so many things about the law, about life, about spirituality, and he's systematically going through the old law with them and showing the spirit behind the law, God's intent through the law that was given. And I want us to take a moment and think about this and put ourselves in their shoes about, you know, they grew up in a religious setting. They were a religious culture. They were a theocracy. And many of us here have either grown up going to church or we've been participating in church for years, decades, some of you over half a century. And that's a lot of exposure to spiritual things, to religious things. And it's possible the things that we have heard said are not always true. And taking time to reflect and say, you've heard this well, let's think about this and taking that time to reflect and process and to test things is what's happening with Jesus's audience here on the side of this mountain and it's relevant for us here today. I want you to think about what has all contributed to the way you think. I want you to think about that. How did you come to the conclusions that you currently have? And think about the, the possibility of those different potential influences, such as the education you received, whether it's elementary school or whether it's you know, further education in college or maybe it was training you got from your work. Perhaps there was an upbringing and a conditioning that took place in your home life. Perhaps just the culture that you have been exposed to either here or somewhere else and just marinating in that for who knows how many years has started to influence the way you think. Or even spiritual teachers and preachers or people um, online or that are speaking things that sound good or maybe even partially true, there's a lot of things that have been projected and invested in you over your life. Think about this. How many lessons, devos, sermons, and classes have you heard throughout your life? I mean, put a number to it. Hundreds? Thousands? How many snippets and podcasts and videos online have you watched regarding either just the news, let alone religious and spiritual things, or just self-help stuff, how to live your life? 
How many talks have you been, have you received about what you should do with your life on any subject? Again, put a number to that over the breadth of your life. And it is astounding how much information is broadcast to us, especially in this day and age. There's a lot of opinions and convictions out there. You have heard that it was said. How many things have you heard been said to you? It's astounding the amount of opinions and convictions and thoughts we have all received. And it's essential for us to take a step back and sift through what we've heard and figure out, okay, what's real, what's true, what's worth hanging on to, and what's worth casting aside. So let's continue this train of thought. Jesus then says, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So Jesus is referring to something that they heard regarding back to the old law. And what's really interesting here is this sounds reasonable. This seems good, loving your neighbor and hating your enemy. But what's fascinating is in the Old Testament, the phrase love your neighbor is there, but hating your enemy is not there. And that's something that through time and tradition ended up getting tacked on as the Jews in their own reasoning, like, well, we love our neighbor, we do love our neighbor, but hating our enemy, we can hate our enemies. And Jesus highlights that that is not accurate, as we're going to see, it is not okay to hate your enemy. And that's something that their culture and their tradition ended up deviating massively from the heart of God. Jesus then says, but I say to you, this iconic phrase in the Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, does that phrase carry any weight to you? That Jesus is speaking. Does that, does that mean anything? Do you feel anything when Jesus says, but I'm telling you, but I say to you, how much weight is behind that phrase? How much authority is there in your mind for Jesus saying, I'm talking to you, I tell you, does that get your attention? at all. I, uh, throughout my life, especially my childhood, um, I went to a, a non-denominational Christian school and I had all sorts of different friends from different religious groups, denominations, local churches, and I would go spend time with them and I would, I had a lot of friends in different groups and I would see different congregations and churches and there would be different things about their dynamic and their um, time together that some things I found really interesting and I found really exciting. Some things like, oh, that's really weird and I don't know about that. And then when I went to South Africa to go into missions, there was the missionaries there that I got to work with, they had a really contagious and inspiring perspective. And their belief was, what did Jesus say? And let's do that. Because there's a lot of different opinions and convictions about what people think is right or wrong. And the only person I actually really now care about who thinks what is right or wrong is Jesus. And letting him be the authority for how things should be makes everything work and make everything okay. Because there's so many different opinions and claims and, uh, and, and perspectives for how things should be. But there's a lot of comfort in knowing that Jesus talks to us and tells us. And that we can go to scripture, we can go to him to listen to him. Okay, God, what is the right way to live and right way to go? Because there's countless amounts of teachings and ideas out there from people. The only person I really care about is Jesus right now for how, do, how are we going to do this? What are we supposed to do? And I've fallen in love with that spirit of what did Jesus say? What does the Bible say? And let's do that. And that spirit I find here in this congregation, I always want to fan that flame everywhere I go of what is Jesus saying? And let's do that. You can't go wrong with following Jesus. You can go wrong every time following me, following somebody else. And if, you're, if it's not Jesus, it's wrong for truth. There's, he has a monopoly on truth, 
It doesn't get shared with anybody else. He is truth. And I could preach hours and hours and hours on that. But that's not today's lesson. I got to take a class years ago about gospel and culture and how gospel and culture interact and sometimes conflict. And we had to do this cultural study about all the major cultures throughout the world and different character traits that are found in those cultures. The two big things we were looking for was collectivism and individualism. And with individualism, an independent spirit is very, very prominent where um, you don't let groups or the community decide things for you. And there was a ranking system for which cultures were highest in different things. And for individualism, the United States ranked number four as the most individualistic people on the planet. Australia, New Zealand, and Scotland were the top three. And, and, then, it was, and then it was us as number four. But that was the United States as a whole. I think Alaskans are even more in, individu individualistic and stubbornly independent, at least more so than most other places in the United States. And that's not necessarily bad or good. It's just some traits that we have that can have some strengths and weaknesses to them. But we have, through our culture, typically, a spirit of, um, don't tell me what to do. And in certain scenarios, that can be really, really powerful in a good way. In other certain scenarios, that can be very, very bad. Jesus is talking to you, and he's going to tell you how to live your life. How are you going to respond to that? Don't tell me what to do, Jesus. I'm going to do my own thing. Or are you going to say, I'm listening. You have authority. I do not. I'm listening. Jesus saying, but I say to you, does that give you an ear to listen? Or are you just saying, eh, you do you, I'll do me. That's your truth. I'll do what I think is right. My personality compounds this even further. I, have a, I had to take a bunch of personality tests for that same class. And my personality is I have a dominant enough personality where um, not, I don't like dominating other people, but I despise being dominated. Or if someone is trying to force me or push me into something, then it just is like, nope, no, I don't want to do it at all. I wanted to do it before, but since you told me to do that, no, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and so that, personally, this is more difficult uh, in that Jesus is telling me, this is the way you need to go. But the thing about God is he doesn't dominate you. He invites you to walk with him in this direction. And that there's a lot of freedom in that. And so I say all this before we're going to get into it. He's going to say some radically difficult things in today's lesson. Some really uncomfortable things that don't jive well with a lot of our upbringing and our culture. And I want us, we're kind of tilling the soil here of our minds of Jesus is talking to us. And we have to make a decision. Is he worth listening to? And that's something we never leave that Jesus is talking and that he's worth listening to because there's nobody else like him. So you sh he now says, you shall, um, but I say to you, he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So let's unpackage this. This is really something easy to say, it's difficult to understand, and it's even more difficult to actually do. So let's, let's think this through. This word love is this unconditional love word agape, this sacrificial love, this word of I'm going to seek your betterment. I'm going to pursue a quality of life for you, and I will go at lengths to help you have a a higher quality of life and is, has nothing to do with your behavior towards me or towards anyone. It's an unconditional love. It's not just a silence and a tolerance and a patient endurance towards someone. 
when we talk about loving your enemies, loving your enemies is not not shooting them. It's not, I, I'm loving them by keeping my mouth shut. That's, is that how Jesus loves people? Where he just, okay, I just won't attack them. Or I, I'll just ignore them. How does Jesus love his enemies? Because we were once his enemies. How does he love us? We'll talk about that in a little bit. So love is providing a quality of life for others. And it is a, that quality of life is um, a godly life for people. We want what's absolutely best for them. And this, something else we need to determine and unpackage is this word enemies. Do you have any enemies in your life? It's not a word we use all the time for things. We're like, oh, we don't get along, or this person maybe hates me, or you know, we're estranged, or they're opposed to me. The word enemy, we sometimes use in like a warfare terminology, but it's not so much in uh, society levels where this person's my, that, that right there, uh, he's, he's, an, he's my enemy. And we sometimes joke about it or we use it as a broad term, but on an individual level, we don't typically peg people as, yeah, that guy right there, he's my enemy. And so we need to figure out what, is, what does this mean and who fits inside this category so that we can know how we're supposed to interact. How do we love them and how do we pray for these people? So I want you to think about who could be your enemy. Who wants to see you diminished or destroyed or who has contempt towards you? We all have people in our life whether we know or we don't know, who would wish us harm or at the very least would not wish us love? And it's pretty easy for us to imagine someone across an ocean who would want to hurt us or kill us and we can believe that those people exist. It's easy to also believe that someone might have a different religion or political viewpoint and they just oppose me because I'm in this group that has these beliefs and so they're just going to attack everybody in that group. It's pretty easy and it's common for us to think and discuss those types of things culturally. But what about you in your individual life? You as a person has someone who is opposed to you who doesn't care about you, who's apathetic towards you and just doesn't care because that is a form of, of an enemy is someone that uh, just doesn't care for you, who would, would be okay if you just stopped being. Who would fit that list in your life? Is it perhaps you have a coworker, childhood acquaintance, or friend that's no longer a friend? Perhaps you have, a, even at times, perhaps a spouse, or perhaps someone that abused you at some point, where we can look back in our life and, okay, there's, there's some times and there's some people that, there's some unresolved um, apathy or resentment or contempt, bitterness towards me from that person, and I don't think it's resolved. And I can, you can, and it's un, so unpleasant to think about those things and those people and identify them, but what Jesus is giving us here is the opportunity to be like him and to be free from the way evil and our enemies tend to destroy us, there's a way that you become more than a conqueror over these types of evils by the good God can provide us. And we're going to see how that happens. And it happens with praying for those who persecute us. It happens from loving those who hate us. Because this type of action doesn't come from anyone else other than God. This behavior of loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. I have a side note I want to make here about praying for, your, for those who persecute you. I've seen over the years, some people take this, this teaching uh, in like a very legalistic manner in which, uh, yeah, I pray for those who persecute me. I pray that their planes crash all the time. Okay, you're missing it. <laughs> Treating people the way you'd like to be treated, praying things that God does for God's will, not just things that we've earned. We can check a box like, yeah, I prayed for them. I, I obeyed what Jesus is saying. Um, we're gonna give you, I'm going to give you an example of what 
praying for those who persecute you look like? This is Acts 7, 54 through 60, and it's the stoning of Stephen, the first uh, Christian martyr. And in verse 59, Stephen cries out as they were stoning him. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Because I've been, I've been thinking and praying about what happens when you pray for those who persecute you. When you pray for those who hate you and want, it would be okay if you died. What happens when you pray for them? James, the book of James says that there's great power, a prayer, a prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And I think of Stephen's prayer here, and I'm being uncomfortably challenged and inspired by recognizing, I think there's a lot more going on here than Stephen demonstrating very powerful character. But this prayer to God do not hold this against them, might have changed the world in way more ways than just an example of forgiveness in this moment. Because, as you can see in the middle of this passage, if you noted, there's somebody standing in that circle. There's a man named Saul that's there. And Jesus interacted with Saul in the not too near future, after this moment, and we all know Saul became Paul, ended up becoming one of the greatest instruments of God in that century. And I don't know exactly how connected Stephen's prayer and Jesus interacting with Paul and bringing him into his mission, how much direct correlation is there. But James says there's great power in the prayer of a righteous person. And Stephen was pretty righteous. He was, he was the real deal. And I think that prayer had some power behind it. And I don't know how that all unfolds. But I see somebody who is here at that moment, being, who is, in, is participating in murdering a Christian... And that person prays for them, and then we know the rest of the story. So I'll leave it to you to reflect on that, of how much praying for those who persecute you can affect them, and through that, change the world. That's a lot deeper than I can explain here in 30 minutes. So ponder that, in thinking of, and meditate on Stephen's prayer and Paul's conversion and praying for those who persecute you. There's a lot more dots to connect there than I have time to elaborate on. So Jesus talks about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. And then he uses this, this word in verse 45, so that. I love so that's in scripture. Because it's showing this is a thing and then there's a cause and effect. This causes this. So whenever there's a so that, I always highlight it, take note. This is a time to learn something because there's so many amazing things about life. I love looking up at the stars. I love looking at creation and just being like, that is just magnificent. The way that that galaxy does this and the way that the star revolves this way or that this bug does this thing. I just eat that stuff up all the time. But those are just things that are. This is something Jesus is teaching is that when this happens, then this happens. That's something you can participate in. And it doesn't just happen instinctually through just intuition or just nature. There's something that takes place when you love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you so that. So there's a, there's a cause and effect, and it's definitely worth taking note of. Something is about to happen. In verse 45, continuing, he says, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Do you want to be children of God? What it looks like is loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. 
It's not just being polite. It's not just being nice. It's loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. I wrote here in my notes, the apple shouldn't fall far from the tree. If God is your Father, guess who you should be like? You should be like your Father. And Jesus then goes on to explain what this looks like. He says, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus is teaching us here that God uh, is not karma. He's not an indifferent system of just good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and that's how the universe operates. God does not operate that way. He does not interact with us in the world in that manner. He makes it rain on the evil and on the good, or on the just and the unjust, and he makes the sun rise on the good and on the evil. I had a teacher and mentor say something to me once, and it, it shocked me, but I've come to see that it is true and that it's good, and that God is not fair. He's just. And that... I, I'm, unco- I'm to this day like uncomfortable saying God's unfair. But it's true. But it's true. I have, I'm one of six siblings. I have four adopted siblings from Romania. And is it fair, the difference in our childhoods of what they've had to go through versus what I had to experience here and and being raised in, up in my biological parents and not having to go through all the horrors that they went through in, in the years of they were in a foreign foster system and separated. And it's just there's so much that they went through and were stum- had, had stumbled through that I never went. That's not fair that they were born in that country and I was born in a different country, that we had different upbringings. That's not, we didn't have the exact same circumstances. That's not fair. It's not fair that Jesus went to the cross he didn't deserve that. It's also not fair in how excessive God paid the price for us. He overpaid the price for us. Jesus' sin on the cross is an infinite sacrifice of righteousness. Because all of us here have a finite amount of sin. It's a crazy huge number, but you could possibly, potentially, catalog your whole life and have a tally marker for every time that you stumbled and sinned and missed the mark. And, and you could do that for the entire world, and there would be one bajillion big number for all the sins of mankind. And the blood of Jesus isn't just whatever that number is. But it's an infinite number. He, and so it's not, Jesus, God didn't just pay the fair market value of our sins. He overpaid it. He was, it was an unfair sacrifice, but it was justly done. So God is not fair, but he is just. And, and that's what grace is. It's unfair. We didn't deserve this, but he's just and giving. He didn't find a loophole in the system. He paid the price justly. It was unfair. And God being unfair is very much a good thing for us. And it's part of his nature that he makes it rain on the just and the unjust. He goes on to show how this is different than anything else in the world. He says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And Jesus is driving home this point that in being light of the world, being salt of the earth, of being sons of your father, there's something different about you that this world has never seen before. Because everyone else in the world is just, just do what, it's really kind of reap what you sow. 
exclusively. That is a, there is wisdom in that teaching, reap what you sow. But it's not exclusively how God's heart and how this world is supposed to operate. So there's something supposed to be radically different about God's people. That they love their enemies, they, pers- they pray for those who persecute you. That we rise above the circumstances other people try to put us in, or do put us in. And that there's something different about us than any other people in the world. And you see, love is a choice. It's not something that's forced. Okay, we, We've talked about that before, that love is a choice. And when somebody loves you, in return, you want to love them back. That's almost like conditioning. That's in, that's that's instinctual. That's natural for us to have that relationship together. And nothing that's bad, but there's a different kind of unconditional love when you are being attacked and you are being mistreated. For you then to respond with wanting to provide quality of life to them, wanting to desire their best. That love is exclusively choice. Because your instincts, your feelings are like, I want to kill this person. I want to run away from this person. I don't want to experience this. But for you to step into that, to face that, that is 100% choice. And that's why it's 100% love. Because love is choice. And it's, and it's by choice that you are then demonstrating that behavior. And animals don't operate that way. Nothing else in this world operates that way other than God. That's why it's God's love to make that choice to treat people who hate you with love is the heart of God. God is love. And it's while we were enemies with God, Christ died for us. It's that loving your enemies, which is where we joined the family business where we don't fall far from the tree, where we participate in this mission of all men being saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth, the truth that God loves his enemies and is willing to even die for them, to wash the feet of your betrayer, to have this heart that is committed to your good, even if it costs me my life, because that's what I am now. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because... He first loved us, and Romans 5.10 shows us that while we were enemies, Christ died with us. In, I took some marriage, um, we did some premarital counseling years ago with Annie and I, and also there's a book called Love and Respect that was very great, and it was a big part of our premarital counseling. And it's coming from um, Ephesians 5 about the dynamic of marriage and that men are, and husbands are specifically told to love their wives, and wives are specifically told to respect their husbands because men typically operate more on respect and women and wives typically operate more on love. And it's kind of like speaking a foreign language to each other where men typically get respect easier in our minds. We operate with respect and women typically operate with love easier in their minds and their hearts. And so you almost have to learn the other person's language and, and communicate it to them for marriages to be optimized. And when someone is, for example, like in, when a man is being treated disrespectfully, he then wants to respond unlovingly. And when a woman is, and a wife is being treated unlovingly, she instinctively wants to be disrespectful towards her husband. And it's called the crazy cycle in this book, where it just starts spiraling more and more and more and more down and then explodes. And the concept then is somebody has to break the crazy cycle. Somebody has to put their foot down and say, you're being unloving or you're being disrespectful. And instead of responding with what I instinctually want to do, I'm going to choose to love or to respect even when you're being unloving or disrespectful. And when someone in the opposite ends up being true, when someone is being loving, the other person then want, is wanting to be respectful. And then there's this growing and love cycle that happens. And I find it so fascinating because like in Ephesians 5, Paul talks about that this marriage relationship is a profound mystery because it pertains to Christ and the church. And going back to 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. So Jesus breaks the crazy cycle of this world of just reacting to how people treat you with more viciousness or just loving when people love you. But when you love your enemies... You're breaking the crazy cycle of this world, not just the marriage in your home. 
And so when we participate in God's mission, we're sons and daughters of our Father when we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. The last thing Jesus says in this, sub, um, in this passage, verse 48, he says, You therefore, pertaining to everything we just talked about, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So not only is Jesus saying, but I say to you, he's not just saying, I'm the new authority on here, and saying that you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Men, tradition, culture, experiences, none of those get to be the standard for what's right. They're all claiming they get to be the standard for what's right. Your own understanding, your parents, your family, your spouse, your culture, your president. So all these people will be saying, this is what's right and what you need to do with your life. And all of them may be right, might be wrong, but there's only one person who's always right. And it's God the Father, because he is perfect. And we need to recognize that he's the standard. He's the one that matters. He's the one we're going to revolve around. He's going to be the true north to our compass that's how we're going to operate, and we're going to try to be like him. We're told not just to recognize, yeah, he's good. I want to be like him. I need to be perfect. That word perfect also means complete. I don't want to just be approved in your eyes. I don't want you to just think, oh, Mike's spiritual. I like him. And they're like, oh, that's good enough for me. I want to be like my father. I want to have his heart, and I want to pursue him. And and then John, the apostle, he was here listening to Jesus saying this on the mountain. And about 60 years later, he writes, um, or no, about, about 30 years later, he writes this letter in 1 John explaining what this be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect and how we live this. 1 John 5, 7, he says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And if we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. I could preach for years on this. Um, and the reason I mention this, though, is because being perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, just in that self, that seems like that's in, like I'm not perfect. How how can I do that? And First John here explains this: where God is light, so He's the standard. God is perfect, and when we walk in that light, we then have a fellowship with God, and His Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So in walking with Jesus, trying to be like Jesus, and we're walking towards God, in that dynamic, in that relationship, we are then cleansed from all unrighteousness. It's in that fellowship with God that we are then made perfect in the eyes of God, which means we actually are perfect because he's the one that gets to decide what's perfect because he's perfect. So I wanted us to wrap up with this dynamic being explained that when we are recognizing God as the standard and we're pursuing him, then we are sons and daughters of our Father, that we join him in this walk of this being in the light. And that light looks like loving your enemies and praying for them, for praying for those who persecute you. Some of us have more enemies than others in our lives, and we don't have fair lives in that all of our lives are the same. Some of us have more burdens in different ways. Some of us have just different circumstances at this moment. But what I want us to conclude this morning with is that God is the authority and he's worth listening to. And I don't know what all you are going through. Some of you are going through things I can't even imagine. But because of what Christ has done, he has enabled us and equipped us to be able to be like him to be able to forgive those who are evil, to be able to pray for their good, for those who are out for you. And in that, you can participate in what you were designed for, to be children of your father. I've, I've wrestled a little bit with 
resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness in some ways in over my life. And one of the most challenging things someone has shared to me about that was not forgiving somebody is like drinking poison thinking it's going to hurt somebody else. And there's a lot of evil and messed up things in this world. And if you harbor that hatred and resentment towards them, it's killing you, not, not them. And this concept of loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you is freedom from that poison and that anger. And Jesus will elaborate much more on this, and, and we'll look at it in the future, but he talks about if you don't show mercy, you don't give mercy, you don't receive mercy. And there's a long list of reasons to be angry and mad at the world, but when you put cro the cross in the equation, you realize, okay, things are unfair, and that's a good thing for us. And it's in that grace, like we talked about a few weeks ago, that's where we're supposed to live. And that's what we bring to the world is a message of forgiveness. And we're going to break the crazy cycle of the world by being like Jesus. And that's what we get to participate in, and we should never stop. So if there's anyone here who needs help in any way, that we can bless you or participate in your growth, we want to do anything we can. You can come forward or talk to us um, this morning uh, while we stand and sing this next song.